we're uh, we're away. No, we're away. <laughs> no, we're uh, we're just starting early with just a quick tipple ourselves, just to get the palate right. Just in case you uh, you have tuned in early, it's very important to know that uh, whiskies you do need to actually um, suffer your way through the initial burn that is so the alcohol. So we do that by nosing it. Who we got here today? Anyway? Actually, who have we got? Well, I believe, <laughs> and I only believe. Um, we have, well, thank, thank you to everyone who actually is tuning in and bought the, the packs to do the tasting with us. This is the first one we've done uh, whiskey this way. Um, it's interesting. I still prefer feedback and, and talking and chatting. So I've definitely brought in uh, two people who can help me out on this, and that's uh, my regular off-siders. We have Pat, uh, the novice wine drinker, but what's your whiskey appreciation been? It's been quite, quite extensive, hasn't it? I've always, had, I've always been a bit of a fan of whiskey. Yeah. Um, I've never had the power to appreciate the higher end stuff, but whiskey being my preferred spirit of choice, um, yeah. I've, I've had a large amount of time on it. <laughs> You've been drinking a little yeah. bit, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, nice way of saying straight, that. straight whiskeys or blended? A uh, mix, sorry, mix with mixes. Oh, uh, well, starting off with mixes, yeah. um, but then like, I don't know, once just sitting down and having like a just whiskey on ice is my favourite. Um, yeah, a little bit of water is yeah usually sure. the way I go. But yeah, mixers just I've actually switched to ginger ale now. Just okay. Yeah, gone away from the coke. Yeah, the coke. <sighs> yeah, but coke is life. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> can it take us away? Yeah, life. yeah I was gonna say. Mm. Uh, and Dan, what's your what's your um, background with with whiskey? Not as big actually. I think Owen might be the novice in this one. Pat might be the the, uh, know a bit more and you are yeah. a know-it-all. So, yeah, so it's just, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm position. still a know-it-all, yeah. yeah. I've been to plenty of tastings, I've probably tasted plenty of whiskies, but it's mm. not something that I regularly drink mm -hmm. um, in my own space of drinking, I guess. Yeah. Um, I much prefer my rums to whiskies, but I've got, still got a good appreciation for them. Yeah. Look, um, and my background is, when I first started drinking, I was a massive um, American whiskey or bourbon drinker. Um, and I, I have to say that uh, if the, early, the when I was younger and, and drinking Jim Beam and stuff, I just couldn't drink it. Like the mixers, it was just something to throw down really quickly. I'd just try not to taste it as much as possible. So everything that was sweetened was lovely. But I actually ended up housemating with a, a guy who was a, a bourbon lover, and he taught me about um, sipping bourbons. And uh, yeah, once I started on that road, you just couldn't come back. Just a good, smooth, drinking spirit, be it bourbon, whiskey, vodka, whatever. Neat is probably the best way to show it, although a lot of these are used for cocktails. Um, a lot of whiskies and a lot of bourbons, uh, a lot of the spirits we look at in everyday life, we do use uh, as mixers. And uh, depending on your um, economic demographic, you might also be mixing top end whiskies. It's up to you. Um, honestly, you should never look down on anyone who has the money to do that, because we like to call them clients. Uh, <laughs> that being said, though, I I have actually passed my diploma of spirits education, so I do know a little bit about it, or enough about it to get me in trouble. Um, and if I do say anything incorrect uh, or wrong in this, uh, please feel free to put a comment down the bottom. I will respond to them. I always find that. Uh, it's intriguing to actually get that uh, that response and feedback from it. But um, just want to say hi to Dave and Andrew uh, and Brendan, um, Mark and Howie uh, and Rachel if she's part of that group. Hey, does Rachel drink whiskey? I don't know. Well, I'll find out from Rachel later then. Um, uh, uh, Frances later when she's she's having a time for whiskey then. Uh, but thanks to all the guys for for tuning in, Pete and all the rest of you guys. Um, this actually makes it worthwhile for me to do because I feel like someone's listening. <laughs> Talking into a camera is just not my thing. I just don't, don't really get it. Um, so what we're doing today is we're going to actually look at the journey of whiskey. So essentially when we're looking at a journey of whiskey, what I'm talking about is whilst many cultures, many places grew barley, malted that barley and did turn it into a spirit, uh, and in some cases ate it, in other cases just drank it. Um, we're going to look at the popular global view of whiskey. So as you can probably guess, um, iconically today, the 
I'd say that the, the heartland of whiskey is definitely Scotland, um, but it wasn't always. So before, whilst they grew um, lots of barley in Scotland, produced whiskey in Scotland, uh, they never really sold it internationally and globally. Uh, and in fact, a lot of whiskies were looked down upon for quite a long time. These days, we look at single malts and we talk about single malts, but back in the day, people in the 1800s, 17, 1800s, would much, much prefer to buy Irish whiskies. Um, and in fact, Ireland was a massive whisky producer. Um, it was once the most popular spirit in the world, uh, went through a late decline in the 19th century. Um, so much that it, it actually had, there was 94 distilleries in Ireland up until the 1890s. And then, basically by the 1925, there were four. And there were four all the way up until 19, I want to say 80s, the 1980s, um, when a, one of those became three. And then it actually went back in the 90s a massive research of Irish whisky has occurred. And in fact, these days, we're now looking at quite a few different Irish whisky distilleries opening up in places like Teeling's, um, Glendalough, uh, there's one in Dublin, I can't remember the name off the top of my head. But um, we'll just take a, a step back before we go too far. So, oh, actually, just before we do, sorry. As of June 2019, Ireland now has 25 distilleries in operation, with a further 24 planned or under development. So going from a low point of three going up to a high point of, well, it's going to be essentially 50 distilleries turning up in the next couple of years. That's, um, that's pretty impressive. So the oldest known record of whiskey comes from Ireland in 1405 in the annals of Clonmacnois, where it was written that the head of the clan died after taking a surfeit of aqua vitae, or water of life, um, it's the first known mention in Scottish dates from 1840, uh, sorry, 1494. Um, so declared whiskey, uh, so a lot of the times whiskies in Ireland were um, illegal distilleries and in Scotland throughout the most part there was a lot of illicit distilleries. But in Ireland where they were getting taxed, um, they said the only people that could make whiskies in Ireland were, and I've got to read this, the peers, gentlemen, and freemen of larger towns, which as they only controlled up to and around the area, fortified area of Dublin, they couldn't really stop anyone producing anything else. Um, but anyway, in addition to uh, blended whiskies, the Irish distillers um, also had a, a how can I put it nicely? So Irish whiskey has always been classically uh, double distilled and then moving into a blending of those whiskies to make a lovely smooth the drinking style. It then went to triple distillation and that triple distillation became so easy to drink that people were drawn towards Irish whiskey and Ireland produced a lot of whiskey and in fact it was a major major export of Ireland. Um, and then several things happened. So the main ones, the two big ones, were the trouble started. So in the Irish bid for freedom, they offended the UK, which was their biggest market, because obviously they're trying to get out from underneath the British yoke. Um, and prohibition kicked in to America, which was their other largest exporting partner. Not to mention that they struggled a lot to follow whiskey trends. So blended whiskies, which are literally single malts blended together and a grain whiskey added in to smooth the whole thing out, were um, were the big the big driving lines of Irish whiskey, but as people's tastes grew and changed, particularly over the, the 1900s, they didn't really follow the market, so they kind of lost a lot, lost their way quite a bit. Um, so obviously, the loss of the United States in 1920 to 1933, um, they were really hampered because economy of scale is a really important part of whiskey distillation and once they didn't have it, they couldn't produce it. Probably one of the, the biggest things that, that happened with Irish whiskey, um, and it was actually a guy called Anais Coffey, uh, a tax collector who then left the tax department, um, formed the coffee still. Now, this is a pretty interesting idea. So I'm 
don't know how many people here, but I'm gathering you all know about uh, distillation in regards to copper pot stills. They're quite a large, um, basically it's a copper pot. Uh, it can be anywhere from the size of a fridge to the size of purple pallet. Really. They can be any size. But copper pot distillation was really, really important. Um, but it can only produce so much because you had to feed it in. And once you fed it in, then you actually have to keep going through. So the um, first thing that happened was Anais Coffee developed a column still, and this column still was pretty amazing. So what we're going to do is look at the first whiskey, which is an Irish whiskey, which is number one, and that is Jamison's. We've already been sipping on some Jamison's, but we can sip on some more. So looking at the Irish whiskies. which were world renowned at that point. We um, they developed a coffee, the coffee still, and that produced whiskey continuously, it's a continuous still. Really, really impressive, and uh, distillation was made so much quicker and easier, and you extracted more from it. So, and as it's tripled the still, it made it smooth and easy drinking. So have a look at the Jamison whiskey we're having. So this is produced at Middleton Distillery. Uh, it's the quintessential Irish blend. Uh, even Jim Murray, the renowned whiskey writer, um, give it 95 points. It's re remarkably consistent. So, what are you getting out of that, Pat? Um, a little bit of vanilla, some, like, um, a little bit of spice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um... A little bit of honey or something? I don't know. Yeah. 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 What do you get there? Um, I get the honey. Mm. Mm -hmm. so it's almost got that texture as well, the stickiness. Yeah. Yeah. About it, yeah, it's quite full body. But... Yeah, for what it is, you, yeah. um, you're looking at a, according to the taste note I've got here, full floral nose, smooth sweetness of marmalade and fudge. I'm not getting marmalade, but I'm getting definitely fudge. And hints of Madeira. If you've had Madeira, it's like a, a cooked um, sort of flavour to it. Uh, thick, good body, notes of orchard fruits, and cooked with a little vanilla cream. Um, spice and honey are the two big things that I'm getting on this as mm. well. It's a, it's a great, yeah, it's very smooth, and that's the thing. Irish whiskies were renowned to be very, very smooth. And when Ireland lost its um, market share, um, because remember that bars in America were using this for cocktail making, um, you know, for their top end clients. Once that actually happened, they really were struggling to, um, bartenders in the UK and in, in uh, America were, were still trying desperately hard to find good whiskey. And as Ireland basically was lost all of its distilleries and embargo, they had to find the next biggest whiskey producer, and that was Scotland. So, oh yum. Yeah, I'm sorry, that's really good. Um, We've got a bit of a love affair with Jamison's here at Purple Pellet because, well, we do drink it a bit. Yeah, well, it's um, yeah, well, it's one of the spirits of choice at the mm. bar as well. Mm. Mm. Well, it's affordable when it comes to whiskey pricing. That's very yeah. affordable mm. compared to some of the others. That we're yeah, drinking. We'd like the next one. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so, to give you an idea. Jamison retails for about forty-five to fifty bucks a bottle, and it's a really and an excellent little buy, no matter how or where you buy it, it's, it's actually really good. And they have a whole range of expressions as well. And those expressions can be anything from stout aged, stout casks finished, IPA cask finished. They've got age statements. And that's the big thing about Irish whiskey now, is now it's beginning to grow and evolve. So Scottish whiskey was essentially lots of single malts but blended. Uh, it was mainly a blended whiskey. Now, the, um, now they're beginning to, and then Scotland went into single malts, and now uh, more about single malt expressions, whereas Ireland was still about triple distillation, easy drinking. Now I find, with all the other distilleries opening up, you're getting age statements, you're getting, slight, you're getting peated whiskies, you're having regional whiskies, um, 
you're getting uh, finished whiskies, like finished in casks, like Madeira casks and uh, port casks, etc. So there's been a resurgence for Irish whisky, which means that you're going to get some really good and interesting whiskies coming through. So um, is there a danger of them having too much for their own good? Not really. Scotland hasn't had it. Yeah. I mean, Scotland's produced whiskies that I'd sort of look at and go, why? But then they become really popular. Mm. So yeah, my 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 view on it is, well, if, if people are getting behind it and drinking it, keep producing right. it. Um, I was actually really impressed with the um, like the Jameson Stoutcast one. Like, mm -hmm. um, first looking at it, it was yep. um, um, I thought it was a bit of a gimmick. Like, yep. I, I, I was sincerely doubting you could probably taste um, what they were trying to go for. The idle casks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah the, especially the Stout, the Stout cast one. Yeah. Like, yeah, that one, that one is well worth like the extra what, ten dollars or whatever it is for a yeah. bottle. But yeah, yeah, I have to say. I'm not sure how your phone works, dude. <laughs> anyway. Purple Palais. Purple, yeah, we're, we're, we're actually trying to, if you're putting questions on there, we're trying to answer them. Um, just Pat's phone is having a spac attack at the moment. Or it could be just us having a spac attack with his phone. So, here we go. Let's turn it down. I'm a bit concerned. There's someone called Shabby Thunderbuns. And they think I'm a big hunk in the middle. I'm really hoping they talk about Pat. So the next one we're going to go on to is the actual Scottish whiskey. So once once the Irish whiskies were dried up and, and hard to get hold of and weren't producing much, then we went to Scotland. Now Scotland has a bunch of different regions in it. Um, at the moment, uh, historically, you have five regions in Scotland. Um, realistically, you've probably got six. Um, so you've got Lowlands, Highlands, Spay, which is in the Highlands, but it is actually a separate region. It's where over half the distilleries are. You've got um, Campbelltown, and you've got Isla. I probably would suggest that whilst the islands are counted as part of Highlands, I, I always think they should be separated because their flavour profile is remarkably different. Um, Oh, Rachel's drinking, that's good. Um, <laughs> yes, she does. When do we start drinking? Well, I'm going to do it now. Um, anyway, as I said, so we, um, we're we going to have a look at Belle Blair 1989. Now, this is an unusual whiskey in that it's a vintage whiskey. So most Scottish whiskies and the way that it sort of works is the uh, age statement on it will be the youngest whiskey in there. And the youngest whiskey in a, if it says 12 years, the youngest whiskey in that will be 12. It can be 18, 24 year old blended into it, but the youngest has to be 12. This one is part of a special release that they did. They did three releases in 2000 and I want to say seven, where these whiskies were, so I'll actually double check the note on that. Yeah, 2007. So, and it was a, from a vintage year. So in other words, all the, all the barley, all the malted barley was, was actually done in one year out of one, uh, one malt. So this, what's it, 18 years? 10, 9, Yeah, it's an 18 year old whiskey then, isn't it? It is too. This one? Yeah, because it was released in February 2007 and it's a 1989 vintage. Um, it's a bottle of 2011. Is it? Established in... Distilled eight, uh, 1989, yep. bottle 2011. Oh, 2011. Wow. Second release. Yep. All right, so the first release was in 2007, second right. one was in 2011. Um, so it just stayed in cask until yep. then, and they really just bottled it, it again? It just aged in cask, oh. and then they bottled it in 2011, which yeah. makes it... Oh, I hate my math when it doesn't work. 11 cents, so a 22-year-old whiskey. Wow. 22-year-old whiskey? That's... Um, it's 150 bucks a bottle. That's pretty good value. That'd be smooth. So, I'm not getting it. So, <laughs> aged in bourbon cask for the most part. Um, let's have a quick look at the little format that I've got given. There's more pictures than there is than anything else. Yep. Yeah, no, second release on this one. Yeah, okay. Let's go back to what I was saying. 
Yeah. Nature had a way. Well, we'll so, obviously, with the different regions we were talking about, each region produces was taxed differently, and that taxation produced different regions, and the different regions produced different styles of whiskey due to the um, house styles and the area that it was and the water that, the, that gets used. Um, so, I said there's six, there's only five technically, but I honestly believe that they really, really should have six regions in Scottish whiskey, and I'm... Uh, I'm part of a crowd that, that does believe that, and it's quite a growing crowd because the islands are remarkably different from the highlands. Um, so this is a highland whiskey, and it's a very typical highland whiskey. So very single malt, so it's got spice, it's got length, uh, it's lovely and creamy, it's got some vanilla. You can actually taste a little bit of bourbon cask in there as well. Get this. Deeper than what the Jameson was. Mm -hmm. That's because of the age. So, as it ages and, and more. And Sorry, more. Yeah, and it's quite crisp though. Mm. On, the, on the nose and on the palate, it's quite quite sharp and crisp. Real saltiness out of it. Yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah, really with really the saline yeah. coming through. I actually, yeah, I find this to be a lovely whiskey. It's really, really good. Um, your phone keeps showing down, by the way. <laughs> mm. Yeah, no, I'm not, not thinking that's a great little whiskey. Yeah. Oh, not as smooth as the No, probably more. not. No, it's definitely not as smooth. Because it's the single malt, uh, single malt has more character. And this is why people like single malts. There's more character in a single malt whiskey. Um, because essentially, a smooth whiskey is, is fairly homogenized and. and the, the flavours are all nightly, nicely meshing, but this, it's actually smoothed out, usually by a grain whiskey. Grain whiskey is usually incredibly smooth. It's a lovely little thing to have. Um, Definitely more alcohol too. Yeah, uh, yeah what is the percentage of it? Well, Jamison's is 40, I think it is. Uh, 42. 42, is it? I more light in here. Oh, no, 40 on the dot. Yeah, it's 40 on the dot. Yeah, I thought it was. And that's 43. That's 43. Um, but single malt whiskey is generally going to be a lot more characterful. So the flavour profile will be drawn a lot from particularly the, the copper pot stills that they use. And all Scotch whiskey is made in copper pot stills, barring the grain whiskies. The grain whiskies can be done in column stills. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so you'll get more character, more flavours. And depending on what the distillers are looking for, is yeah, they'll actually... Um, talk about uh, what spices they're looking for, how the grist is made and, and functioning there. Uh, and it also the washback stills are really important in that too. So um, I was going to say, what's the, what's the verdict on that one, Pat, for you? Yeah, I love it. Um, yeah, it's quite spicy. Like, um, it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely got a lot more character than um, the Irish whiskey, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, I can see why it's hundred dollars a bottle. Mm. Well, just the age around. Most yeah. of the like most of our fifteen year olds are hundred and seventy, and twenty one year old Glenn Fittick is like two hundred and sixty, and the twenty six year old is five hundred and fifty, is it or something? It's about that. So yeah, <laughs> not to mention we'll talk about Japanese whiskies later on. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Dan. So um, a little bit of. Um, a little bit of vanilla, I don't really get any of the bourbon characters. The sweetness? Um, yeah, it's got sweetness, but I'm mainly getting the saltiness and uh, yeah. it just sort of sticks to your lips and yeah. it almost dries them out of it. It is a really good food whiskey. Oh, um, right. We talk about doing uh, whiskies with, with food. Most people drink whiskies just by themselves, but obviously some whiskies are, and when they've got a high saline sort of component, like the island whiskies do, I find food goes really well with them. So we've got today, we've got some pate, um, some of the pork, and just some crackers. But it works really, really well. Like the saltiness. Yeah, uh, we're work with the cracker, the cracker no, it's already salty. Already salty. Mm. Mm. I get the comments. Mm. Oh, sorry, we need to put this on the big screen. Yeah, we do. <laughs> we can read what the people are writing. Then. I thought we've got Pat's phone here for. Mm. The people. You know, keep, keep the fans. Yeah. Oh, John. Sorry, John. I thought I said John before, but obviously I didn't. Sorry, John. 
Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> All right. Well, let's say if you're enjoying that one, let us know because I really enjoy that one, and I'll be taking a bottle of that home with me today. Mm. Now, Rose is watching from home too. She, she is, I hope. I don't think that's shabby thunder bun, so. <laughs> okay, so um, from here, Scotch whiskey is really broad and it was really loved you know, globally. But as all things, a young and upcoming, upcoming country like the US isn't going to let something like that slide. Uh, a lot of expat Irish and Scottish ended up in America, um, immigrants. And of course, when they got here, they found massive belts of grain uh, and crop growing regions. And whenever you can grow something, you can then distill something and make an alcohol. Uh, and so what, what they did is uh, they developed an American whiskey. Now that American whiskey has evolved into a thing we call bourbon today, or bourbon whiskey. Um, but there are still American whiskeys being produced. Um, just to give you a heads up, if you want to call anything Scotch, it must be made, matured and bottled in Scotland according to the certification laws that, of that country. Uh, minimum of 40%, can't be any higher than 60, 66% on the initial distillation. Um, I'm trying to think, no, you may add colouring, but most people don't. And when it comes to uh, any additions, you can't really add anything but the, the basic, can they? If it's a single malt, it must be a malt, um, all malted barley out of one distillery. If it's a pure malt, it can be several malts from several different distilleries. Probably the classic one, Monkey Shoulder, it's from three different distilleries. But no grain whiskey added in there. And a blended whiskey can be malts from as many different distilleries as you like with the addition of a grain whiskey in. And grain whiskey, um, that's it, sweet in it. Just barley. Barley, wheat, rye, whatever. Not really that. Uh, but yeah, it must be a grain whiskey. Yeah. Is it common for such a whiskey to retain such light flavour and color on the palate? Yep. Yeah. Um, it is common. With the, the aging whiskey, what will actually happen is it draws more flavour profile from the barrel. Um, and it also, the flavours in the distillate will actually evolve um, and give it a more intensity. So when you make a whiskey, you have a lot of congeners or flavours in whiskey. And as basically what you're doing is distillation is removing water and leaving a lot of the flavours in there. So they become quite intense. Um, when you actually put it into the barrel, it gives them a chance to evolve and actually turn into a, uh, and draw wood from the oak. And so you don't want to overpower it with oak or the vanillins, but you do want to put oak in there to give it colour, increase the intensity, add vanillins, add some cedary notes or nuts, uh, and then release the, the whiskey. You can actually have a, a completely clear spirit, which would be lovely and flavourful, but the longer it's aged, the more development that occurs in whiskey. So older whiskies will become more intense, um, will actually have, uh, usually have a, a much softer um, palate weight, but will be quite intense with the flavour component. So yeah. Do they use any new oak? Uh, no. It always old oak? It's usually, it's usually older oak. There are a few virgin oak barrels that go into it. Um, but they give so much yeah, oak so intensity much. that it, it will be very difficult to taste anything but mm -hmm. oak. Um, you know, it can be quite quite hard. Oh, that's right, yeah. I've said hello to John already. It's all good. Very good. That's all one. No, it's all the old yeah. stuff. That's cool. cool. Right here. So, we're now going to go to the States. So, when it comes to... Bourbon whiskies. All right, tell us a little bit that you know about it there, Dan. Bourbon whiskies. Yeah, so American so whiskies. Well, they spelt different for a start, aren't they? Yeah, so it? Irish whiskies spelt differently as well. It's yeah. always an E in there. Yeah. Scottish whiskies, not. Yes, if you ever see whiskey without an E in it, 
generally it's it's held for Scottish whiskies. That's not that's not legal. You can have a Japanese whiskey with just a Y and no EY. Yeah. But gen generically throughout the whole distillate world, if a, if it's just a, a Y at the end, essentially it's it's known as Scottish whiskey. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they use a different. They can use different brands. Different processes, can't they, in America? Yep. I'm not sure of them all, but I know there is a difference in, in how they can make it and what they can add to it. Mm -hmm. Well, that, yeah, uh, I thought it was more like a corn syrup um, um, uh, that they use in the process. Um, mm -hmm. And rye, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a yep. common, okay. if that's an actual one or if it's just a common thing they use. It's a common thing they use. Yeah. So, bourbon whiskey was only ratified and recognized in 1964 by the US Congress as a distinctive product of the United States. Okay, so it's got to be at least 51% corn must be in a new container of charred oak. So it's got to go into a new one. Got to go into a new one. Why do you think that is? So that they can sell it to the other suckers that are going to need those barrels later. <laughs> sort of. Sort of. Try that one of the major industries in America is logging. Logging. Yes. Yeah. So oh, yes, they have actually like huge like um, oak plantations. Yes, they stuff. do. Yeah. Yeah. Not for much longer, I guess. Well, no, they're, well, they're, they're, they're plantations. And plantations. They've been they've yeah. been doing it for for decades. Yeah, but how how long does it take to grow an oak to full size to make barrel work? I think. They're pretty quick. Yeah, I think yeah. twelve yeah. twelve years. Oh, yeah, that's pretty quick, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> but when you've got thousands of trees, yeah. 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 Um, so it was probably brought. It was probably brought now. Well, this is not historical fact, but it's probably brought in about the eighteenth century by the Scots and the Scots Irish which is probably fairly true. The invention of bourbon is often, often attributed to Elijah Craig, a Baptist minister and distiller, credited with many Kentucky uh, firsts, including uh, fulling mills, paper mills, rope walk. It's said to be the first aged product in charred oak casks, a process that gives bourbon its reddish colour and distinctive taste. Um, the Craig legend is slightly apocryphal. They're not really sure if that was true. Uh, so what actually happens is it's a major grain mixture of 51% corn aged in new charred oak containers uh, distilled to no more than 160 proof or 80% alcohol by volume. Um, enters the container no more than 125 proof or 62.5% alcohol. Uh, it is bottled, must be bottled at 80% in the States. You might notice a lot of uh, American bourbons that are done here are at 37 and 38%. Mm -hmm. That's actually literally to avoid tax, because the tax on, on excise and spirits is quite ridiculously high in Australia. Um, there's no minimum specified duration for the ageing period. The product is aged as little as three months and sold as bourbon. That's pretty quick. Exception is straight bourbon. So what does that say? Does that say straight bourbon? Uh, which is a minimum, bourbon, yep. yep. Which is a minimum ageing requirement of two years, in addition to any bourbon aged less than four years. Uh, must include an age statement on the label. Bourbon that meets the above requirements have been aged for a minimum two years uh, and does not have added colouring, flavouring or other spirits but is not required to oops, be called straight bourbon. Bourbon's label as straight has been aged under four years must be labelled with the duration of its ageing. So this is a straight bourbon. So it's under four years old. It's 40% alcohol. Um, it actually fulfills all the criteria for American bourbon. Um, it doesn't need an age statement. It doesn't need an age statement on it. That being said, though, there are processes that occur with bourbon that um, you can do a bit, uh, in, for Tennessee whiskies. So American bourbon is generally found in the region of Kentucky, but it can be made anywhere in the U.S. and has to follow all those rules. Tennessee whiskey undergoes another pro procedure other than that, which is actually filtering it through a sugar um, charcoal. Sugar charcoal. Sugar charcoal. Sweet. Yeah. So it, it's, it filters out a lot of the impurities in there, but it also adds some sweetness to it as well. Um, also, they when they're distillation, they actually take... When you finish distillation, you've got a sort of a mash at the bottom of it. That mash is removed out. In Tennessee whiskey, they put that mash back in there. So that's where you get the sour mash. That's what's called yeah. sour mash. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. It's just left. It probably does sit down and go sour. It? it does sour. It's very, very sick. Yeah. But that's what also gives those... The mould as well? No, no, no. It's been distilled. So it's... Oh, okay. cooked. The mash itself the won't ma get mould. No, no. Well, not, not for a long time. 
it's as high acidity as well. So they take it out and then they reintroduce that back into the next distillate. And um, yeah, that, that gives a whole bunch of sour mash flavours to it. And they put it through that sugar uh, charcoal that fills it through. Back up again. And it gets sweetened back up again. Yeah. All right, so it's the flag. Okay, this is actually the flagship, Buffalo Trace flagship, made from corn, rye, and malted barley. Aged in new oak barrels in historic old warehouses uh, for award winning. Um, it's done, okay, no more than 40 barrels at a time. It's back from no more than 40 barrels. So that means 40 barrels are used in the blend for that whiskey. Um, it's aged on the middle floors of the distillery. Uh, temperature fluctuations, where, sorry, where the temperature fluctuation is greatest. Top whiskey with oodles of vanilla, barrel char, and spicy complexity. So, what they talk about in warehousing, you've got three different levels in a warehouse. You've got the ground floor, where there's not a great deal of, of change. It's actually quite cool. And your longer aged whiskies have a tendency to sit in there. The middle floor is where you get quite, because remember, it's America, it's quite hot and cold. Yeah. Hot and cold. So, in the middle area there, you get quite a large fluctuation of the heat during the day and the cool in the evening. And the top one is usually where they've put a very specific single cast because of the massive aging that occurs and the, the barrel breathes. So in the hot times, the barrel expands. And as it expands, it draws whiskey into it. And as it gets cold at night, it contracts and pushes the whiskey back out of it, which is why you get more color and more flavors from the barrel going into it. So those in the lower parts, it's so less. Would they rotate? Once they're happy with what's going on at the top of the go, we've got to put that down in the cool so it stops. Oh, that's a good down. question. I don't know. I haven't actually asked that question myself. But I do know that um, they really like it. If it's a, a young, quite um, overpowering whiskey, they'll actually put it in the top part. And therefore, they'll get more oak component to balance it off. If they, if it's a quite a, a soft, easy, light whiskey, they'll actually put it in the, the bottom part of the barrel house. It's completely different from Scotland. Where it is cold. No, that's all I can say. It's cold. <laughs> when it comes to aging, if you age something in Scotland, um, and then you age something in the Caribbean, basically it takes a third the less time. So a twelve-year-old, so a five-year-old Caribbean-aged rum would be equivalent aging due to the barrels and, and the breathing as a fifteen-year-old Scotch whisky. That's the that's the amount of temperature Cause variation. Temperature. Yeah, the fluctuation of temperatures. So that's really, really important to know when it comes to um, production of whiskey and mat maturation of whiskey, particularly the maturation side of it. So right, what are we getting in this one, guys? I actually really like this one. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I get a lot of like toffee, yeah. like yeah. caramel, like obviously yeah, it's the new oak. Yeah, yeah. Really. you can tell it's American. It's quite sweet. Yeah. yeah. As soon as you get that sweetness, yeah. you go okay. Yeah. But it's like good smokiness. Yeah, a little bit. Like, yeah. I actually thought it was smoking a scoop of rum back out of this one. Oh, okay, right here. Yeah. Because like, before I tasted that, I was starting to get a smoking as in my mouth after yeah. eating something. Yeah. Because I, yeah, that it's, it's got that you know, sort of toffee, brown <laughs> sugar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Sweet yeah. oak, lots of sweet oak. Um, what's it actually say on this? Uh, oh, okay, so it's brown sugar, toffee, apple, sweet oak, custard. Custard. Yeah, I'm not getting custard. Yeah, I'm not getting custard, no. Oh, the espresso beans. Oiliness. Uh, I can get that. Definitely yeah. got an oiliness. Yeah. yeah. Chocolate covered raisins. Toasty wood. I like a good toasty wood. Is that someone ringing to say stuff? Talking and answer my question. Yes. Um, yes, it is. In after the Belvedere, it is a sweet style of whiskey, particularly. Mm -hmm. I find the Belvedere probably a little bit more, and I'm going to use the word balanced, even though really it's not a, it's not a, a very whiskey term. Whiskey term you can really use. Balanced with what? Alcohol. Mm. I guess you can have flavoured alcohol balance. Flavoured alcohol, yeah. Um, if it just burns and there's no flavour, then well, yeah, that's a good only burn. I will say though that if, um, yeah, that one's smoother, a little bit more structured. This one I do find it's really overt. Um, mm. It's actually really American. Yeah, I, I like American whiskey is kind of my um, my guilty pleasure. Like yeah. even though like yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, more complex and like interesting flavors you can get for around the same price. Like I'll still stick with. Like, I actually really like that one, but I also like like Dickel and things like that. Yeah, yeah, it's just a guilty pleasure, and yeah, I yeah, love it. It's good. Um, I can. Yeah, I, I've never understood when I was younger and I drank American bourbon with Coke. It it was sweet on sweet on sweet on sweet. Mm. 
go looking back at myself now, I'm like, how the hell did I drink it? You know, Sorry, I can actually Martin understand Jones. throwing dry ginger into Jamisons. I can understand even throwing um, a ginger beer or something like that through um, probably not that one, but uh, say something like a, a wild turkey or a Jack Daniels. Jack Daniels is probably a bit more. I can un- I can understand putting that in, but putting Coke with with that that's. Um, is where the Coke is the um the go to mixer like um for especially Ameri- American spirits like yeah. being sweet they want to kind of counteract that but then if I know it might just be something in the American flavor they just want ultra sweet. Well, I must admit, yeah, we um <sighs> we got bugger all Coke actually in the States, Pepsi yeah. or or a cola, but not Coca Cola. Yeah. yeah. So Coke wasn't like it. Definitely not. No. Pepsi. Oh, so um. All right. <laughs> yeah, I love that one. Yeah. And for, for the value for money as well, like... Yeah, 55 to 60 bucks, I think it is. I think we had it on so like, yeah, 50. Like, yeah. It was... But I think, yeah, I think it's 55 yeah. to 60 dollars a bottle. Yeah, um, oh, God, regular. And, yeah, that's eminently drinkable. Like, yeah. Really, really drinkable. So we do, we do mini grout off films. The boys bring their test tubes back and go, yeah. <laughs> no. 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 Would be a great idea though, wouldn't it? Maybe it's a bar. Yeah, I don't know how that <laughs> When the bar, bar reopens again. No, so I don't know how that would go bar, say. Yeah, yeah. Happy bar, say. Yeah. Okay. We kind of play on through this food. We've got a slide. It's good in food. Yeah, it does, I must admit. Because mm. the pate is nice and cool, it actually cools the palate down. It just does warm up quite a bit. Yeah, it's quite a bit of spice, actually. That's probably what's. I mean, alcohol will warm up, but it's sort of the spice as well. Mm. Oh, that could be the pepper in the top of the pate. Eh? Yeah, I have to go with that one. That's, that's really lovely. Mm. It's a little bit easier to go through than the, the wine tasting one we did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, we don't have as much. Yeah. If, if I poured you 150 mils of whiskey, we'd, we'd, well, we'd well, like it. it into the tasting. It would probably be a very good day, mm-hmm. but it would be a rather and, abrupt ending. And like the wine tasting, we won't be sitting here at the end and just polishing off the bottle. Uh, <laughs> we don't do that. We drink responsibly. We didn't even polish them. We just drank them. Just drank them, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, the last one we go to from, okay. The biggest thing that's happened in the world of whiskey in the last five years has been the growth of Japanese whiskey. Now, this is number four. Japanese whiskey growth, what can I say about it? It's been dominated uh, by two companies. So, a quick history of it. It began in about 1870 when the first commercial production was in... Ni- uh, sorry, tell the lights, go take time. Whiskey production in Japan about 1870, they started playing with distillation. Um, but the first commercial production was in 1924. And the first ever distillery in Japan was Yamasaki. Uh, the Japanese whiskey style is similar to Scotch whiskey than any other style. Um, several companies produce whiskey in Japan, the two best known, and these are the ones that dominate the market over there are Suntory and Nikka. So the two big figures in the history of Japanese whiskey, Shinjiro Tori and... Masa, I'm getting this right. Masataka Takatsuru. I'm glad I could say that, yeah. I'm glad uh, you know you got it right. Yes, I know. <laughs> so Tori was a pharmaceutical wholesaler and founder of the Kyoto Buke, which became Suntory. He started importing Western liquor and created a brand called Akadama Port Wine, based on Portuguese wine that made him very successful. However, he really wanted to get into whiskey and making Japanese whiskey for Japanese people, despite strong opposition from the company executives. He decided to build the first whiskey distillery in Yamazaki, a suburb of Kyoto, in an area famous for its excellent water. He hired Masataka Takatsuru as the distillery executive. Takatsuru studied the art of whiskey distillation in Scotland and brought the knowledge back to Japan in the early 1920s. Um, He established the Yamazaki distillery, but in 1934 he left to form his own company, uh, Dai Nippon Kaiju, which would later change his name to Nika, and he established the Yoichi Distillery in Hokkaido. So, here's a thing for you. 
in Scotland, if you decide to open a distillery, uh, or even decide to create a negotiated brand whiskey from Japan, uh, from Hello. from Scotland, you can go to whiskey distilleries, even ones owned by Diageo, um, Suntory, uh, Coke Amatil, anything like that. You can actually go to those distilleries and say, "I'd like to buy barrels of whiskey," and they'll they'll sell you them. They're expensive, but they'll sell you them. And then you can blend those into a bottling and negotiate. There's actually a very famous one called Blue Hanger, done by Berry Brothers and Rub. It's re really renowned. It's about 190 bucks a bottle. But you, that's a negotiable brand. You can do that yourself if you want to, or you can buy whiskey from those things and blend it into your whiskey to make create a pure malt. Especially if you're starting. Those brands are actually just buying other people's and yeah. blending them. Saying it's theirs. Yeah, well, not yeah, well, it's, it's theirs because they're the negotiators. They've blended and matured it in their own areas. No. Um, a brand new distillery in Scotland that has never had any historical background or, or any backstop can actually buy malts. Uh, and this is happening in Ireland. You've actually got distilleries who are only been open five years, um, or have only been distilling for five years, and have a 12-year-old whiskey. They've essentially bought that probably from Middleton or Bushmills or somewhere like that. Uh, matured it in their, in their casks and then have released that under their own label. They blended it themselves and matured it themselves. But Scotland's renowned for its blending. Okay? So what I'm saying is that you have the option. It's a very open market system. You can get some from the Cardew Distillery, from Mortlark Distillery, Linkwood. Put it together, create a whiskey of your own and you can even sell that from there. Japan's completely different. These guys are what's called vertically integrated whiskey distilleries. So let's just take Suntory. The two major distilleries, Yamazaki and Hakushu. So at no point can you buy a barrel of Yamazaki or a barrel of Hakushu and use it in your own whiskey. Uh, in fact, those two, two distilleries come together to create Hibiki, um, which is a, a pure malt blend. Okay. So you've got those. They, they, everything from the purchasing of the grain to the production of the whiskey to the maturation of the whiskey to the bottling of the whiskey to the export and sale of the whiskey is all inside that company, top to bottom. So, because they're owned by the same. Yeah, because they're owned by that that company owns every single stage now. So they're very insular in the way that they produce whiskey. Okay. So this is. Really important to understand because um, you'll actually have other distilleries opening up, and one of them is this one. So, this is the Satori blended whiskey um, from the Kiriyoshi distillery. Oh, really? I'll start on this side then. Good. Yeah, was it? Well, no, we'll go back to it after the camera's still a little bit of colour in there. Okay. So, when I was researching this, and I'm going to apologise off the bat to the rep who put this whiskey onto me, um, I researched it and had a look through it. So, I was a, you feel a little misled with this, because it says, since 1910, and during my research, this is the tasting note that I found, or the note that I found for it. Uh, Kiriyoshi, pure malt whiskey and Tatori blended whiskey are the first Japanese small scale craft or G whiskies to be released in Australia. Created in the shadow of Mount Dyson at the Matsui Distillery, Kiriyoshi and Tatori benefit from the mountain's crystal clear waters and the distillery's 108 year of production experience to craft this superb Japanese whiskey. Right, and on the bottle, it's got established since 1910. So, would that suggest to you that these guys have been producing whiskey since 1910? Yes, that's right. According to what I read, no, they haven't. They actually make soju. So it's a, a, a wine. So it's kind of misleading to put that on your whiskey bottle. The company's been around since 1910. They haven't made whiskey. No, they haven't made whiskey. In fact, the whiskey distillery got built in 2015. Nice. <laughs> That's a start. They got the licensing for distillation in 2017. 
and they produce a 12-year-old whiskey. In 2020? Oh, no, no, in 2019. So here's a couple of questions for you. And if anyone out there is a whiskey aficionado that knows this company, this is the Kiryoshi or Tatori, um, the Matsui company, I should say, please let us know because I was a little bit confused when I was researching it. So, a couple of things. On most whiskey bottles, I'll see if it's on this one too, um, a lot of the time, here we go. So, Kentucky Straight Bourbon, distilled, aged and bottled by Buffalo Trace Distillery in Franklin County. This one over here. Um, Belle Blair. Uh, here we go. Distilled and matured in Belle Blair Distillery, Scotland. Okay, right here. Let's have a look at Jamison. Product of Middleton Distillery and Distillery Cork. It doesn't actually say it's aged and matured there. So, this one just says product of Japan. Okay, that's good. Let's, let's try and figure out what that means. So, in my research, uh, it doesn't actually say distilled in Japan anywhere in the bottle. Uh, Matsui Shuzo has been making soju since 1910, and the company acquired their first license to distill in 2015. Uh, they only began distillation at Curiosity Distillery in 2017. And in 2018, Matsui Shuzo obtained a second whiskey distillation license for their Tatori um, distillation area. So, nothing yeah. about that. Um, so, so the Matsui whiskey brand, they're calling it a sub-Japanese whiskey due to the fact that malt is imported. Um, so in other words, barley is malted overseas and brought in. Uh, and the other dist details of the whiskey at this moment, if the company's product page is believed, it's distilled at least partially into Tori. Um, Yamazaki Yoichi have roots in imitation whiskies as well. So, yeah, essentially this whiskey itself it's an unaged statement whiskey. It's a blended Japanese whiskey, and we said blended includes grain whiskey. Mm -hmm. um, it's essentially there's a at the best we can hope for. It's a two year old whiskey that is uh, like the youngest and it's two years old. They bought in Scottish whiskies that could be any age at all. Like generally, you're probably looking at a five to twelve year old whiskey being bought and brought in, being blended in there. So this is like I feel. Just with the flavour profile, I'm just literally on noting and tasting that. I'm getting that it's quite smooth, it's quite rounded. Um, it's fresh cream. Yeah. Uh, you got smoke. Yeah. This one is smoky. Yeah, I smell a bit of smoke. There was someone else too, yeah. uh, really smoky. Actually, it's really smoky. Actually, not even peaty, it's smoky. It's smoky as. Yes. Which suggests that you're probably looking at a Scottish whiskey. Um, I really think it's, it's, a, it's a blend of that two year old Japanese whiskey and Scottish whiskey. That's on the assumption that they use. Where, where did the 12 year old come from? Uh, the Kiyoshi 12 year old is a bottle that we, we have sold it here oh, previously. Okay. So I thought you were referring to this one. No, no, this one is actually has no age statement on it. Um, it's actually quite lovely. Um, I don't mind it. Uh, I, I will say it's more of a blending whiskey for me. Uh, when we first decided to put this one on, um, we decided to have a look. I honestly wanted to show you a really top-end Japanese whiskey, but I can't even afford to buy the top-end Japanese whiskeys anymore. No. No. Every time they come in, they're more expensive than what they were three months ago. Yeah. Yeah. The reason that this has happened is because there's been a huge upsurge in Japanese whiskey. They have not produced enough to actually get them through what the global market requires anymore. But that being said, if they could sell every bit of whiskey they make. That's not really a problem, either, is it? Yeah, but also remember they've only got, so they're aging whiskey all the time. Mm. So let's just say that 10 years ago when they started, or when they, when they did the, let's take the Yamas, yeah, the Hibiki 17. Mm. Minimum age of that 17 years old. Probably some 20 to 30 year old whiskey in there as well. Yeah. So they have not produced, 20 years ago, they never knew they were going to sell this much whiskey now. Mm. 
no way would they have thought that. The explosion of whiskey, it's just gone through the roof. Um, particularly with the opening of China, with the middle class. I don't think that's happening anymore. No, well, it's, it's slowed down a bit with the COVID, but as I said, with the explosion of the middle yeah. class, you've got a lot of dollars looking to buy good whiskey. Um, and, you know, Japan is has won lots of awards around the world. The Americans are right on board. There's 340 million people in that country alone. It's not like Australia with 20 million people. We're talking, these guys have got massive, massive deep pockets to buy whiskey. And they'll buy a lot of it. And so Japan never considered that its whiskies were going to explode into the market the way they did. And now they're going, oh my God, we've only got so much. We didn't plan this 10 years ago. We didn't plan it five years ago. It's only been the last two or three years that we've they've realized that they're going to run out of whiskey. Yeah. And they've had to create blends that you know, well, three to five year old whiskies to, to fulfill that market. Instead of using their older whiskies. So what they've done is they've they've had to create these these um, mid range whiskies to sell. So they can sell a heap of mid range and yep. still put some aside to try and age up to the, yeah. the seventeen. And then remember they get to blend that back into their twelve, eighteen and twenty four year olds and thirty year olds. Which is sad if it's seventeen year old. Well we were selling the Bicky 17 year old for 160 bucks a bottle, my boy. Yeah, now? 650. Thank you. Wow. It's not that good. <sighs> Sorry. Yeah, I, I don't know. Look, I, I'm going to say, it whilst if you gave me a bottle of that, I know you love me. <laughs> yeah. If you gave that to me when it was $160, I know you love me. But. As soon as you got to 650 bucks a bottle, oh my god. That being said though, like you're not going to find anything so sunshine in a bottle yes. as you've been 17 year old. There's a lot of people out there collecting it. Yeah. For resale, obviously. Yeah, the second hand market is enormous for it. How do they get away with that? Selling so on eBay. Uh, if you are looking to sell stuff onto the second hand market, you cannot do it on eBay without a liquor license. You can go through Grays Online or places that uh, Langtons will sell second second so they auction it for you basically. Yeah, and they take a fairly hefty cut out of that too. I do see a lot of the time in uh, Facebook that people do it. That's a private sale. Mm-hmm. If they ever crack down on that, and that's a big if they ever crack down on that, then that'll you know, that'll be pulled I'll up. Sort of be cracked down straight away. Yeah. Well, you don't have a liquor license, you can't sell it. True, but there's, yeah, there's Facebook, it, that's on Facebook. Facebook's in America, which has different liquor laws yeah, as, as Australia does. Um, eBay, however, because it's running in Australia, it's an eBay for Australia, you actually have to undergo a whole bunch oh, of okay. checks for yeah. the liquor licensing for that. Yeah, and how you word it, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much. One like bottle of alcohol. Alcohol yeah. for not for sale, bottle $600. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's that's actually happened. Yeah. Um, there was actually a thing saying uh, limited bottling of such and such, and it, and it just showed an empty bottle and it said six hundred and forty bucks, and people went, yeah, I'll buy it and bid that. And it went for a thousand dollars. By the way, it was just a bottle. Oh, <laughs> Suckers, <laughs> like you idiots. Uh, so we're back to the curiosity. So let's now that we know that yeah, it's a little bit deceptive. Okay, it is a little deceptive. Um, I, I really do have to say that. What do we think about it? Though? Quite like it. Like, yeah, <laughs> I don't mind yeah. either. Yeah, even yeah, all deception aside. Yeah, yeah, I, I love the smoky flavour. Like, mm. In fact, wasn't really what I was expecting from a Japanese whiskey. Are any other Japanese quite smoky? I haven't actually had any. No, Yamazaki's aren't smoky. They're they're really not smoky. The uh, Hakushu has got a little bit of. Peatiness to it, but only a really tiny bit, and that's why that peak was stopped anyway. So it's a bit, yeah. Um, well, it'd, have, it'd have to be the peak for me because I actually like peaty, yeah. smoky. Yeah. So, um, and for uh, I think eighty-five dollars a bottle, it's actually quite good. It's um, a bit lighter on the palate. Than that. Yeah, it, it is. is a lot, a lot lighter in colour. Does it not a lot of oak in there? Or? Um, I don't know. I reckon I do get Japanese white oak. So. We've talked about American oak, which is obviously American oak. We talk about American oak in wine, it's very butterscotchy, caramel. French oak is a lot more vanilla bean, 
with uh, a bit of spiciness to it. Japanese white oak, I and I'll, I'd like someone like Brady to, to talk to me about it a bit more. I find it does have that sweet character to it, but it's also quite spicy. And that's what I'm getting from this. So I think the whiskies have been bought in uh, and a little bit of their own whiskey added into it. It's then been blended into this. Um, and I reckon they've used new uh, Japanese white oak in it. So that's where I'm getting that really punchy. You're talking about virgin oak barrels. I reckon that's what's, what I've been sitting in, in there. Because it's got um, creaminess to it. So if they brought in Scottish whiskey and stuck it in new oak, it would really, really drag some of the old flavour to it. Change some of the old flavours, I guess, and put the new flavours in. Yeah, so you're getting a lot more of those oaky earth flavours in this. We talked about oak before, so I reckon the smoke just comes from. And we're back. <laughs> I'm not, not quite sure what happened there. It did it last time, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it didn't, didn't help when someone tried to ring you last time. Yeah, that was a bit hard. Maybe I shouldn't use my phone so much for it. But no, as I said, uh, Japanese white oak, I, I think. I can see that being the smoke that's coming from probably the, the Scottish whiskies that we brought in. Yeah, it wouldn't even surprise me. I'd, they are making it to be a Scotch style whiskey. Um, the funny part for me is that if I was given this blind, I would be confused as hell because I really think I'm getting some charry notes that you get from a bourbon. <laughs> That's why I was wondering if the smoke's coming from a char. That's, yeah, I, I'm saying it's. I, I, it's almost like I wouldn't be surprised if this was either a charry, could be a charry oak barrel that they used in the blend. But it's more colour. So the white, the new white, white oak must have sucked so the colour. Well, no, the oil of that or just a touch of the, like the yeah, out of eight barrels, you put one barrel. Oh, charry. Okay, just a white colour. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I, don't mind, I actually don't mind it. <laughs> Um, quite surprised. Yeah, definitely, definitely not the normal notes you get from Japanese. Uh, yeah, no, Rachel much prefers the, uh, give me the scotch any time. Okay. That's, give me all the scotch. I want your scotch. I take all your scotch. Go, Rachel. We like Rachel. Okay, well, um. Yeah, really, it's not much more to say, really, is there, for the whole thing? Yeah. Are there any other, like, um, countries of note for whiskey as well? I know Indians... Uh, well, in. Australia does some pretty good gear. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I've been... Okay, yeah. I'll just tell you now, I have I tried to... I we call Tasmania, Australia, yeah. when we're liking them. No, no, yeah. Lime Burner's from WA. Oh, okay. Um, you know, Melbourne, you've got Starwood whiskey from down there. That's good. Yeah, that's good. Except right. I'm really pissed off with Starwood because they have taken my favourite whiskey of theirs and translated it to something completely different. Is that the Mercury type? No, the, 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 um, they're all about the wine cask now. And I'm just thinking, okay, can't you just stick with the wonderful distal that you had before? No, no, it's, it's wine cask. So, you know. It's because they've got so many available. Yeah, down there, they've they? had the option. And, and it was a bit of a, a, you know, a, a thing at the time. So Australia, you've got, you've got that. You've actually got... Um, Heart, well, what's it called? Heart, I want to say Heartwood in Tassie. I just had a talk to the guy yesterday about it. Uh, one of my customers suggested that I, I look at getting something. It's about two to three hundred dollars a bottle. Um, and I just contact them to see if they, if they wholesale it. Basically, he buys whiskies from other Tassie distilleries, blends it into his own Heartwood um, whiskey blend, uh, and he'll release expressions of them. And literally, he put it up at four o'clock in the afternoon. That here are his expressions, and these were, as I said, three or four hundred dollars a bottle. And by eight thirty, he was sold out. So when I talked to him about wholesaling it, he was like, "I don't really need to." No. I completely understand. <laughs> Jesus, well done. What was, However, the, what was the other Tasmanian one? That did? Lark, Lark, Lark won all the awards. Uh, Lark won all the awards. Sullivan's Cove won a whole bunch of awards. Um, Lime Burners and WA has won previously won some great awards for that too. Um, we've also got places, you know, things like Hillier's Road as well, uh, which is, is quite renowned, probably the, in the cheaper ends of the whiskies over okay, Hillier's Road. Um, so there's a whole bunch of, of really good whiskies in Tasmania. Uh, what else there? Who else is the... Um, Mark wants to know, will there be a rum tasting Facebook live event anytime soon? Uh, next month. Alright. That was actually our next one we're doing is, is rum tasting. 
I would like... It all depends on what's happening with this COVID thing. Either our rum tasting is going to be live, as in what we're doing now, Facebook Live, or it will be in the bar. Um, Let's hope it's in the bar. Well, I prefer people in the bar, like talking to people. People are good. Oh, I think this is fun too. This is fun too, man. Because I can actually talk one side of it, it's great. Yeah, mm-hmm. if we're limited to um, we don't know like actually 1. Point, 1.5 metres and 4, yeah. 4 square metres. Yeah, the four, yeah, well, we can have up to 39 people in there. Carol? Uh, exactly, in the kitchen area. 4 square metres, yeah. 150 metres, so it's not before. Mm. So we can have 39 people so in there. Did we not count the bar and the walls and the toilets and stuff? We no. took it as one big area. It's one big area. Oh, so. But, so um, you may have to sit on the toilet to drink yours, but it's fine. That's fine, I can do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we can have up 39 people. But it'll, be a max, it'll be a maximum of 20 people, um, and it will be for that event only. So that'll, that'll happen. Yes, yeah, so there will be definitely rum, and we are going to be doing one of my favourite, favourite, favourite rums, English Harbour. I love English Harbour rum. We're also going to be doing some Methuselah age statements. Kurt Sweeney? 7 and 15. We can't get Kurt Sweeney anymore. I have a ball. I know, because I gave you one. Merry Christmas. Um, and I'll probably have a look at something else just to sort of give out intro, but Brock Hartley is going to be doing that with us. So you've so got to try the coffee one. Yeah, that's yeah. what we do. Got to have that. Yeah, got to have that one. Anyway, so thank you guys, and uh, until next time, drink well. Mm. Cheers. 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 Yeah. I don't like that one. Yeah. Actually, we've got to go in. Doink.